Welcome everyone. Hi, Terry. Hey, Diane. Just waiting on Kathleen to join. Hey Lorna, hey conversation piece. <laughs> okay, thanks Rhea. Let me see if I can find her. Kathleen, aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Just waiting on Kathleen. She is in the room and connecting. Hey, lady. Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm wonderful. I thank you for allowing me to just kind of take it easy a little bit today. So, <laughs> y'all, you're going to you're going to love uh, Melissa and the conversation that we have coming up with uh, Diane. And uh, I just wanted to get on very quickly to, first of all, welcome you, Melissa, and um, just thrilled to have you. Melissa has been a consultant with Bronze Lens for many years, an advisor, and uh, I'm just so glad you could step into this space for us today. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. And I wanted to make sure that everybody knew all of the important dates that are coming up for the festival. Our dates are August 11th through 16th. It's called Bronze Lens, the Virtual Experience. And so we are going to have a whole entire film festival online. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to uh, put on any clothes, except maybe one day. We want you to dress up. But for the most part, you'll be able to watch amazing films. Last week, you know, we announced the 77 different films that are going to be at Bronze Lens. Um, in addition to that, we've got some great conversations each day that we're calling the Bronze Lens Powerhouse Conversations. And uh, just some truly amazing guests will be joining us for that. Um, each day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday is Cinema and Social Justice Sunday. And for those of you that know Bronze Lens, you know that is something we've done since we started, which is bringing the power of film to issues relating to social justice. Um, that's not anything new, but I think it's going to be quite remarkable when we discuss that on uh, Sunday, August 16th. And then a new thing for us is that our Bronze Lens Awards will actually take place on Sunday, August 16th. And so everybody will get a chance to tune in and see who the filmmakers are that are going to win best in their category. Another date that I have to mention to you is on August the 28th, we're actually going to be announcing who the official nominees are. So last week we announced, we announced all of the selections that will be at the festival, but out of all the selections, there is a group of nominees in each category 
whether it's short or feature or documentary or music video or webisode. And so we'll be announcing those nominees on the 28th, and those are the persons that will actually be uh, in the running to receive best of in their category. I've got some very interesting guests that are coming up for other Bronze Lens Live uh, events. So just make sure you tune in every Wednesday at 4 to check us out on the road to the Bronze Lens, the virtual experience. It's going to be great. Today, you've got Melissa with you, and she's going to introduce Diane, but I want to just give you a little bit of information about Melissa, because as I said, she's an industry professional with uh, many, many years, over 15 years of experience. She's been working in TV and film and commercials and live events, but as I said, she's a good friend of the festival and has been a consultant to us in so many areas. Melissa has probably served in the role of consulting producer for Magic Johnson's network, Aspire TV, for four seasons where she curated and acquired exceptional global content. Additionally, this programming airs on the network signature series, Urban Indie Film Block, also known as, formerly known as ABFF Independent. She's a freelance contractor, and her diverse background includes a storied career as a script supervisor, working with award-winning directors and A-list talent. Simultaneously, Melissa has served as a respected producer on corporate, nonprofit, and live event productions, even as an in-demand teleprompter operator working with our forever floaters, Michelle Obama, you have to put your hand over your heart when you say her name, amongst many others. <laughs> as an industry consultant, Melissa provides support services for various festivals and organizations from logistics to many, many other things. And so, Melissa, for all that you've done for Bronze Lens, I'm just grateful to have you today, and I want everyone to know just how fabulous you are, and I wish you and Diane well. Y'all have fun, and I'm going to sign off, so just, you know, whatever it takes to click me off, I'm going to hit this X here. Y'all be good, ask lots of questions, and I'll see you next week. Thanks again, Melissa. Thank you so much. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone, I'm going to bring Diane into the room. Diane, if you can just drop a comment, I'll bring you in. If you'll ask to be added. Okay, you should be joining in just a second, Diane. Hey, lady. Hi. <laughs> Look, I have mine as well. I got my PPE right here. <laughs> I'm going to take that off. Oh, my earbud fell somewhere. Can okay. you still hear me? Yes, I can. Take your time okay. finding it. I have Thank it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to our Lights Camera COVID edition of Bronze Lens Live. We're going to be discussing returning to work during a pandemic. And our special guest <laughs> is producer extraordinaire, Diane Ashford. Now, before I get Woo! started, <laughs> yes, <laughs> shout it out. <laughs> God, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I just want to let the viewers know a couple of notes before we get started, and then I'm going to introduce you. Um, so there will be a Q&A session following our discussion, so please hold your questions, and we'll let you know when to drop them into the chat below. Also, throughout the show, we'll be dropping um, links in the chat as well for industry resources regarding getting back to work safely. And last but not least, um, as Kathleen mentioned, I am also a script supervisor. I have copious notes. I will be referring to them, so don't judge me. Okay, now for those of you who don't know Miss Diane, let me tell you a little bit about her. Yeah, she is tell me about me, because I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> She's an Atlanta native, a proud alumna of Florida A&M University, fam you. <laughs> But 
What you may not know is that following a successful career in the corporate world, Diane decided she wanted to pursue a career in the arts. So she took a 30 day leave of absence to work as a producer's intern on Rainforest Films uh, film Twa to Pandora's Box. Now from there, apparently that experience was so amazing and impacted her so much that she did what most of us could only dream of. <laughs> she immediately resigned from her corporate job and decided to embark on a new career as a film producer. Okay. <laughs> and I just want to oh. commend you on that, Diane. As a former fellow corporate worlder, um, congratulations for being bold and brave, for stepping out, taking a leap of faith going to an industry that is oftentimes uncertain and leaving that security behind, that takes a lot. And you have navigated this space so well and so consistently excelling in it. So I just have to take my hats off to you for that. Wow. Thank you. That's all I can say is thank you. <laughs> it's not easy, especially now. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit more about Miss Diane. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you deserve all the accolades. As the CEO of Symmetry Entertainment, she has been producing and line producing for over 18 years. Some of her credits include producing feature films such as Motives 2 and Echo at 11 Oak Drive, co-producing Three Can Play That Game, producing supervisor of season four of BET's The Game, associate producing Ride Along and Survivor's Remorse, Line producing The Gospel, Stomp the Yard 2, Ambitions, and currently Terra Lake Drive. What? <laughs> In addition, she's produced numerous, yes, numerous shorts, documentaries, commercials for clients like CNN and TBS. Now, Diane, I know there is a project that was near and dear to your heart that you produced as well for BET, a documentary. Would you care to just expound on that a little bit? Um, it was called The Brotherhood of MLK. So basically, a lot of people didn't know that Martin Luther King was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. And there was only one living line brother of his. And so we were able to find him in Boston where Dr. King had pledged. And it was just that experience was so invaluable. Like we found a picture when he was online and it was it was it was amazing. So a lot of people didn't know that. And those that did know it, um, didn't know that he still had a line brother, frat brother, fraternity brother that was still living. So we were able to find him. So that was like one of the highlights of my career so far. That is awesome. So many stories that we need to continue to tap into. Okay. Well, when Diane is not on set, she's been sharing her wealth of knowledge via her hugely popular budgeting and scheduling class for film and TV producers since 2011. And I have to say, I was in that first class and I can, oh, man. Yes. <laughs> I can attest to how invaluable her instruction was then and still is to this day. Diane, your body of work speaks for itself. You've been recognized by your peers, um, including awards from Women in Film and Television Atlanta, as well as being a Women's Superstar honoree for Bronze Lens. And I'm sure there are many others that I'm just not aware of. Again, we are so honored to have you share your insights with us today. And without further ado, we will go ahead and get into our program. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So let's hey, just... Go ahead. I'm, now I'm seeing people going through. So oh, I'm, just, I'm just doing some shout outs. Hey, Sakila. Um, hey, Kawana. Hey, Jadithia. Okay, go ahead. Well, and let me just acknowledge this as well in talking about Diane and her career and, and all that she's done. If you can see the background, Diane is actually on set right now, and she took time out to speak with us today. So we do really appreciate you being here. You're welcome. I'm actually in one of the trailers, one of the cast trailers, actually. I think the cast member is supposed to come at like eight o'clock tonight, so I'll have to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Copy that. Um, okay, because we'll, we'll... My, my budget's not big enough for me to have my own trailer on this project, but you know, we, we all share. It's all good. So yes, I'm on the set work. of, oh, yes, I'm on the set of Terra Lake Drive. Somebody just said that, Terra Lake, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
All right, so hey, cool. let's jump ahead and talk about Tierra Lake Drive. What is this new project that you're working on? What's it about? And was it something that was already in progress that got delayed as a result of COVID? Gotcha. Um, got to shout out my production supervisor, um, uh, Elwana, who's saying, hey, Elwana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to even put the camera on. She's actually in the room with me. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> But okay, so Terry Lake Drive is a six episode anthology series that's going to be on streaming on UMC. So if you don't have UMC, please download it. I, I know that you can get it just by being on um, Xfinity. So download UMC. I think it's, I think it's $4 a month, somewhere between four or $6 a month, something like that. But very affordable, very good programming for, um, people of color like it's just uh it's very urban inspired but a lot of a lot of stories out there so and ours would be one of those um so it was written by and directly produced by Kawana she's in the chat room her fiance is on set directing it they both wrote it so yeah um the question was though did we get started before COVID or after COVID so yeah. we were a week before um we had one week before it was time for us to start shooting before the world shut down or the country shut down wow. or the state or whatever everybody shut down <laughs> so um yes the whole world so we we literally had one more week of pre-production before it was time for us to start shooting and we got shut down so um yeah we started back up here five weeks ago yeah, five weeks ago we got started. We did we did our one week of production and now we're in our fourth week of shooting. We're supposed to be wrapping today, which is why I said, Oh yeah, sure, I can get on this call and do this with you because we'll be on our last day and the world won't be so crazy. And um <laughs> we have two more days of shooting. <laughs> so, right? Murphy's that's law. That's production. Yeah, Murphy's <laughs> Law. So yes. <laughs> Well, again, we're grateful to have you here, even though your schedule has been uh, extended two days. So yes. knowing that the project was in the works before COVID, were there any changes required to the script as you guys were trying to start back up, the things that just weren't feasible to do now that we are dealing with a pandemic um, and you have to adhere to certain safety guidelines? Yes. So first of all, I want to get a shout out to, again, our writers, um, Kawana and Jerry Lamas. They decided to incorporate the current environment into the script. So they went back and adjusted the script so that if we had people that had on masks, it wouldn't seem crazy. They addressed it. They, we, we talk about it in the script. It's very present in our, um, in our script. So it will not seem foreign to people wearing masks or people discussing it um, throughout the episodes. So that was one thing. So that made our job a little bit easier. But in terms of what we had to do in order to get ready to shoot, um, and real quick guys, shout out to our, uh, our studio at Zet, Brett, Mastermind Brett. UMC.TV is available everywhere. Services are streamed, $4.99 a month, use the code, UMC free 30 for a 30 day free trial. So make sure y'all <laughs> go get UMC. You can stream it live for 30 days. So do that. Awesome. So UMC.tv. Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate that. So um, some of the things that we had to do to be COVID ready, um, we had to adhere. Well, we had to come up with our own protocols because at the time, there weren't, everybody was scrambling, trying to figure out what their protocols were going to be. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to be the first ones at the gate, shout out to us, we did it, we beat everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had to come up with some protocols on how we were going to be um, safe and keep our crew safe, our cast safe, and try to remain COVID free. So we decided that we would do testing once a week. We had, um, we got... Um, hand washing stations that we placed um, throughout the set. We um, we got sanitizer everywhere. We got spray sanitizer. We got <laughs> this, this kind of sanitizer. Um, everybody is required to wear a mask on set. Our hair, makeup, and wardrobe department are required to wear um, face shields when they are in contact with our um, our cast. And and it's a constant. It's a constant reminder. And 
you know, it's, it's weird because when we first came back, everybody was accustomed to being home. So that first couple of days, like it was constant. Where's your mask? Where's your mask? Because everybody is hot. So everybody's mask looked like this all the time. And so we're like, put your mask on, put your mask on, trying to remind people. So it's not something that was, um, has been easy. And it is very hot in Georgia right now. It's like 90 something degrees. It is very difficult to breathe in some of these masks um, every day. Oh, that's another thing. We, we provided masks for everybody. So we have a plethora of masks that our, um, our medic team makes sure. So anytime that someone needs a new mask, they want to change out their mask or whatever, we provide that for them. So there was a, a plethora of things that we had to do to make sure that we were ready to start filming again. Sure, because like you said, coming off a of quarantine for almost four months and then being so happy just to be back on set, muscle memory kicks in, people start interacting with other departments like they're accustomed to, and those protocols mm -hmm. go right out the window. So that's great yep. that you're on top of it and constantly reminding them, please wear your mask mm -hmm. properly, sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, well, so knowing that the project was in the works pre-COVID, knowing that you guys mm -hmm. adjusted the script uh, accordingly. Um, were there any issues with like cast and crew after COVID had occurred? Like, did you lose any cast and crew as a result, either because <laughs> of their concerns about COVID or just maybe script changes where they were no longer necessary? Yes, absolutely. All of the above. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, we pretty much had our crew set, ready to go. Like I said, we were a week out. So we had hired everybody. And at first, we we didn't know how long everything was going to, how we were, how long we were going to be quarantined. So we kept sending out memos like every two weeks saying, hey, guys, you know, we'll be back. We're going to shut down for two weeks and then we'll be back. And it was like, okay, another two weeks. Okay, another two weeks. So literally, we keep sending these people memos saying, okay, you know, here we go, here we go, here we go. Not so much, you know, so, but um, when we were finally, finally ready to go and throughout this process, you know, we were losing people. We lost some cast members that said, you know what? We don't know how is this gonna work? How are you gonna keep people safe? Um, I have small children, whatever, for whatever reason, we did lose some cast people. And then when it was really time to go and we finally said, okay, we're ready to go, crew members started dropping. <laughs> So uh, in our world, it was a combination of COVID and um, unemployment. <laughs> so by now, the government had getting federal unemployment had kicked in. So not only were people getting their state portion, but the federal government, I think, was adding like another $600 to their check or something. And we are a small project with a very modest budget. And we were not paying people the type of money that they would normally um, be used to getting paid. Yeah, It wasn't competitive. So lo and behold, people were like, I can make that type of money sitting on my couch from the government because once they start making money, then the government will stop the unemployment benefits. So we lost quite a few crew members. Shout out to them. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> I'm not mad at you at all. So, um, so yeah, we had to literally during that final week of prep, like get a lot of people back. We lost a lot of people. And then there were some other people who um, had family members affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, you know what? I can't do it. Um, as you know, we lost people from the film and television community right here in Atlanta, Charles Gregory, my heart goes out to him, his family. And so, you know, a lot of people were like, no, it's too soon. We're not ready. It's too soon to come back. So we had to um, make adjustments and we got a pretty good team now. So we were very happy with this team. We, the people that we have were, uh, were people who were just like, you know what? I'm tired of being at home on the couch. Like I'm ready to get back into it. So let's sure. do it. I know it's not a lot of money, but I'm just, I just want to get out this house. So we said, okay, great. We were happy with them. So they were awesome. That's wonderful. And, well, and there's also something to being a part of that first wave of folks. I mean, you don't want to be a guinea pig, but at the same time, you get to gauge the temperature of kind of what it's like, what mm -hmm. protocols are being implemented, where there may be gaps and concerns, and mm -hmm. kind of go, is this going to be okay? Is it not? Especially knowing that numbers were going to increase um, yes. and having to deal with that on top of it. So mm -hmm. kudos to them. 
All right. Um, now, was your cast and crew, were they all locally based or did you have to bring in people from out of town and did that have an impact as well? Yes. So um, we are 99% Atlanta, but we do have a couple of cast members that are from um, out of town. So that was another thing. Like as soon as they landed, we had to have them tested before they got on set. So um yeah, eventually, and I know we'll probably get to this, but our testing protocols, you know, we thought we were going to do once a week, that went out the door. <laughs> so we ended up having to do testing like three times a week. And again, on a very modest budget, that was expensive. So, but somehow we got it, well, we got it done. Cause thank you, Britt. <laughs> <laughs> Are you able to um, expand just for our filmmakers that are listening, that are, are getting ready to try to go through this process? Are you able to kind of shed a little bit of light on the expense associated with testing? Because that's such a huge part of coming back, being able to have that particular component. So let me, let me tell you, I'll be honest with you. The first thing that we tried to do, um, we constantly told our crew members, go get tested because they had free locations throughout the state. And so we provided them with a link for them to go have their free testing done. Um, but eventually, now we're shooting and now we're saying, hey, go get tested this weekend because this is when we were doing once a week. And we, trust me, we were only supposed to be shooting 18 days, three and a half weeks. So at the end of the first week, we're telling everybody, it's time for you to go get your COVID test again. And they're like, okay, wait, we just worked all these crazy long hours with you guys. Now you want us to take our weekend and some of them stayed in line. Some of the places um, shut down on them. They were not able to get their test. So it was a scary thing that not a everybody was able to test over the weekend. By the time that Monday came of the next week, we received new protocols that were, they call it, um, I think it's Safe Forward or something like that, that Safe came down forward. from Safe Way Forward. Thank you came down from all of the unions together. It was um, SAG, DGA, IOTC, Teamsters, like everybody came together and came up with um, protocols. Now it hurt our feelings because the only union that we are signatory with is SAG. And so it hurt our feelings because we had passed all of our protocols with them, told them what we were gonna do, answered all of their questions, sat on numerous, you know, conference calls, wrote up proposals at the proposals, submitted everything, everybody's good, you guys are clear to start shooting. They came to visit us on set, they checked everything, anything that they didn't like, they let us know to make sure, okay, I want to make sure you're doing this. We were like, okay, wonderful. I don't know if you guys can hear that thunder, but I'm sure that's going to affect my team on set right now. <laughs> thunder and lightning. So, um, and so we did all of that. Then Monday hit and new protocols come out. And these protocols are, they have different zones of people. Zone A people are those people that are in close proximity with our cast. And zone B people are those people who um, are not necessarily on set as often. I put myself in zone B. I don't go to set that often. I do all of my work from um, the trailer. Um, yeah, from the trailer. I was about to say it from home, but no, <laughs> it's all from the trailer. I'm never at home. Um, but we um, we try to make sure that, that only the essential people are on set. So now we have to do testing three times, a, um, three times a week, and there's no way we can tell people before you come to set or after you leave set to go get testing. So we had to bring in um, some medical people to actually do our testing on set, on site. So the cost of that, whoo, astronomical. <laughs> so there are two different types of tests. There might be three, but I know there are two that we that we know about and have um, performed. Um, there's one that's called the the finger prick, and it's um, it's like a blood test. But it's the blood like I think there's two different blood test is the one that actually antibody. tells you if the virus is said again the antibody test the rapid the, the rapid antibody test yeah but this one is it's, it's two things it's, it tells you the antibodies and it also tells you if the virus is active so that's the thing a lot of people think that the blood test is only antibodies but no it actually tells you if the the virus is active in your system 
and if you have the antibodies. And we had two separate cases. We had one case where somebody said, where it said that the person um, had the antibodies and that maybe they had had the virus some time ago, but now they had the antibodies, but it was not current in their system. The virus was not. And then we had another person the following week that the, vi the virus was actually active and they actually had the antibodies. So it was first thing in the morning, that person had to go home. Um, everybody else since then, nobody else has ever tested other, other, everybody has tested negative since then. So we're grateful for that. We've been able to keep a very safe and um, um, clean crew, thank God. So, but we knew that something like that was possible for it to happen. And, sure. you know, the other test is the nose swab. And so the nose swab is supposed to test if the virus is, is active in your system too. However, the nose swab test is not rapid. There's only certain places you can go to get the rapid test. And I think it's like labs that have this machine that's able to read it. So for us, and this is just in, in the spirit of transparency, I know that in the future, it will be a thing where I, I think most of the, the unions prefer that you do the nose swab. <clears throat> And that's probably going to be the protocol. However, for us, we were kind of grandfathered in and almost done by the time we got all of this information. So um, we still had the no swap. What we did, if, if somebody tested, I won't say positive, but if somebody, like, if they weren't sure, if the lines, when you're doing the blood test, if the lines are not, like, perfectly dark or something like that, and they're not 100% sure that we went to the no swap. So that was our protocol at the time. Then we found out, no, we, they, then they said, no, we just want you to do no swap all the time, just no swap. And so then we had another problem because there are not a lot of vendors that have the no swap. In addition to that, the vendors that don't, that do have the no swap, they couldn't get the test deck for 24 to 48 hours. I won't even say 24, I would say 36 to 48 hours. So now you have a group of people on set who are accustomed to getting their test results immediately. And now you're about to tell them, okay, no, you're going to go to the no swap, but we're not going to know if you're positive until 36 to 48 hours. That's not, that wasn't going to work. So what we, so far, everything has worked. Everybody's negative. We're almost done. Thank God. We just had testing again yesterday. Um, I think we have another test um, tomorrow, I think, and then we're done. But they, um, I think in the future, you're going to have to have testing done before you start shooting. And then two or three days later, test again, you'll be getting your results back from the first test. So you'll always be getting your results back and then testing again, if they are going to implement this three times a week or make everybody do the three times a week nasal thing. Fingerprint that doesn't test for the active virus. Actually, it does. So, um, Susan Moss, it does. It actually does. We we have confirmed this <laughs> over and over again. We confirmed it again yesterday. It does test for the active virus. We asked the medical person that was out with us yesterday, and he told us, and the one before that told us. So we got we got it. But I know that I know what the standard is. I don't know who that is now. Too <laughs> so, but go ahead. Uh, I think that's Susan with SAG. I think. I think um, so. Yeah, that's why. That's why I realized. I was like, "That's Susan with SAG." She's checking me yeah. out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we asked again. We actually got him on camera telling us that too, because we was like, "Can you please smart. say this again?" <laughs> so right. He no, told us. Okay, yes. so um, if you, if you can't get into numbers, um, can, oh, that's, I'm sorry, you did ask okay. me a number. No, I, I'm happy to tell you the numbers, especially those people who are producers. I'm happy to tell you that no swab test costs two hundred dollars per person. Wow, that that the the blood prick test one hundred and fifty dollars per person. So imagine um, we have a relatively small crew because we're very, you know, it's not an independent project, but it's a small project. But if you imagine how big projects are, if you ever work on a set and you have anywhere between 90 and 150 people on set, just imagine how much that is. So for those of you who are in production, who are going to be moving forward, you have to now incorporate these numbers in your budget. So just know that. 
to hear it from me. And depending on which company you use, there may be a fee on top of that for them to come out to actually perform the test. And that, that fee can be anywhere from like 300 to $400 or something like that every time they come out. So, wow. yes, I want you guys to know. Know the real numbers, know the facts so that you can put this in your budget and you will not be surprised like we were because we were totally, totally not prepared for that. So Exactly, yes. Michelle. Three times a week, those figures. Three times a week. <laughs> yeah. Three wow. times a week. Yes. Okay, so um, I mentioned earlier that there are some resources we're going to drop in the chat, and one of those is a link to some COVID vendors that are in the area. So for our producers and filmmakers that are on, um, please be sure to check out that link so that it can help you find these new vendors that are available offering COVID uh, supplies for set. Okay, um, you talked about the safe way forward uh, mm -hmm. paper with respect to the unions and guilds where they came up with the guidelines. Was there anything in addition to what you've already shared that you had to do? Like you said, SAG was your signatory uh, specifically. Was there anything mm -hmm. extra that you had to do that you haven't already mentioned that is on top of what we would normally do with respect to the actors before you were ready to go into principal photography? I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, I know you've covered a lot about protecting them with vanities um, and the requirements mm. about interacting with them with PPE. Just wondering if there was anything else that we might. I mean, we, we, we try to, I mean, there, there are van protocols. It's not supposed to be a lot of people in the van. Um, but anybody that's interacting with them, we're just trying to make sure that they were negative and that we, even with our cats, and it's hard, our cats can't wear masks when they're on set. So, um, but when we when we yell cut, or if there's gonna be a lighting setup or a lighting change, we're trying to put masks on them. They have on makeup, not a lot of makeup. Thank God this project, it was kind of like a, he, our director wanted everybody to feel very real. So our cats don't have to wear a lot of makeup. Um, we couldn't do makeup for any of our, um, background minors that was one of the things like minors couldn't have any makeup so um they never stepped foot in the hair and makeup trailers to get any makeup or anything like that done so we our show was not one of those shows where there was like a lot of heavy makeup or things like that and uh, you know our, and our cast even our our leading lady her hair was um they there was no wigs no extensions or anything like that her hair is very curly and wavy and they would just you know do little things with it like that um, a lot of times, if they wanted to do their own hair or makeup, they could. So, but they didn't have, we, you know, our project was very unique in that regard, where we didn't have to worry about them being in a hair and makeup trailer, like, for long periods of time. Um, other than that, I think everything else was pretty normal. I, I, but I don't know, if you have a, like, specific question, I, it's pouring down raining. It's pouring oh, down raining. Okay, well, uh, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We also look, my, my supervisors let me know. We also had, I told you about hand washing stations. We also had um, temperature checking every day. So every day when you arrived on set, the medical team was here with the little thing, checking your temperature, asking you if you need a mask, doing hand sanitizers on your hand. They sanitize a lot. They come behind us. They sanitize in the van. She's giving me some more notes. We had... <laughs> Oh, we had, we also, so we had, we had a, um, a COVID, we had a, a medic who was a, um, who is a, uh, what do you call the COVID people that work on an EMT, an e EMT, so she's an EMT, and then we also had like a COVID PA as well, so we had like both of them, they run around, they have, they're spraying behind us, they're wiping handles, we do handles all the time, like wipe a handle, wipe a handle, wipe a handle. Because some people are wearing gloves and some people aren't. So, but we're always trying to make sure, you know, when they're getting in and out of the van, we're trying to wipe down the vans because, you know, people, you never know what people have been touching. So we just, and we're always reminding people, wash your hands, go wash your hands, wash your hands. So it's a different world now. Um, I know we're probably going to get into it, but it also, as it relates to like food, like somebody had a question, I think, about craft services in here. 
Craft services long gone now, guys, are these days where a crafty walks around with that tray and that beautiful food on the tray, or they'll say, hey, there's some type of, I don't know, something at the crafty table. They'll call it out on the walkie, and everybody goes running, and nobody is washing their hands. (laughs) Well, you can't do that anymore. Now everything has to be pre-packaged. Hold on one second. Hey, will you text um, Jerry? Because he just texted me and I don't know what he said. So just ask him what he needs. Sorry, my director is texting me. And I don't know what's, what's happening. Okay. Um, so yeah, long gone are those days of being able to go on the crafty truck and make your own sandwich and all that stuff. Everything has to already be pre-packaged for a crafty. So we're talking chips and cookies and you know things like that that come in the package already. As it relates to catering, Mm -hmm. all of our catering meals are being dropped off to us in individual containers. So there is no more, you know, some big spread that you go by and it's like a buffet. You can fix your plate or whatever. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. (laughs) Raiden said, well, going to miss those days, right? (laughs) Those days are gone now. So our food has, has been dropped off to us every day in individual containers we have a container and it's and it's written on top it'll tell you if it's fish or if it's chicken or if it's vegan um then there's another little container that's your salad and then there's another little container that's your dessert and that is lunch so and i would imagine <laughs> that has to affect your budget as well all of these absolutely that every department is having to do now yes add on to the budget budgets are going to be higher so i hope all of our um, all of our our people who provide funding eps and um studios distributors like these things cost money and if we're going to and i know that it's needed for us to stay safe but that's extra added expense so yeah okay um so so let's talk about uh set life during COVID production, are you having to adjust your work day as far as perhaps decreasing the hours that you're shooting to accommodate all of these protocols that you're having to put in place? Or are you still running a traditional uh, shoot day? How is that working? We're still running a traditional 12 hour shoot day. So things are good there. But I'm sure you're probably feeling as a production an impact to what you're able to accomplish in that 12-hour day, though, correct? Yeah. I mean, because even on testing days, you know, we, we try to tell people to show up early, so, but they, that's, that means their workday starts earlier, which means that I'm now having to pay them overtime because it's not going to be 12 hours from when they started testing. And some people don't show up early. They'll show up at call time. So we still are trying to test them. And like the other day, um, the guy who was doing the testing couldn't come until midday. So now we're trying to tell people when you have a break, break come away. test. It's not too many people that can break away. So yesterday we literally had to hold up the, the scene for a second because I had to have my director test. I was like, my director, my first AD, my DP, you guys have to come out and test. So, well, at one of did. At one of <laughs> practically pulled them off the set by their ears and like that's you have to test. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah so of course that that you know took some time so it the the, the test comes back I think in like 10 minutes so they, they usually will test and run away and then you know pop back up in 10 minutes or like what's my results what's my results so we have to tell people unless we call you back to the table assume you're a negative <laughs> so yeah okay um so we talked briefly about talent from a union standpoint but i'm just Mm -hmm. wondering with respect to uh and we talked about hair and makeup but what about sound like are you guys strictly using a boom or are you actually lobbing talent how are you handling that piece of it we're doing both um boom and lobbing and it's just and he's only um he's only having to be near them during those few minutes, but he's covered and making sure that, you know, he, and where they can do it themselves, he'll tell them how to do it. But yeah, we're still doing the traditional way of, of lobbying to, to get the best out of them. Copy, copy. 
Okay. Um, so looking at the time, what I want to do is go ahead and encourage our viewers to start to drop their questions that they may have in the chat. I have a couple mm -hmm. of more points that I want to go over personally with Diane, and then we'll get to your questions. So right. Diane, um, now that you've gone through this, oh my God. You've been mm -hmm. hazed, <laughs> the first project uh, during the pandemic, what are some realizations that you have now um, that perhaps weren't even accounted for in the white papers that we saw um, with how we would get back to work, what it would look like and, and what it would take? Anything that you could mention? You know what? It's funny. Let me, let me just say this, too, because you asked me if the day was affected. It is affected because before everybody could kind of be in the space, even though people would scream and yell like, g and &E has the space, art department has the space or whatever. Um, it, it's even more so now. Like when we say g and &E has the set, like nobody else can be on the set but g and &E. Once they are clear, like we may do some type of spray down, wipe down or something like that. Then we say next department. Now you can go in, get in the space. So we were always trying to go behind them after they finished being in the space, making sure that it's completely cleared out and only that particular department is in the space. So I guess that is a little different because at times, you know, you would have the first AD standing around or, you know, other people in the space. And even though people would yell at them, uh, it's definitely, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read and try to talk at the same time. It's difficult. It's you know, <laughs> it definitely, um, you know, little, little nuggets of time were taken up every day sure. trying to make sure that we remain safe. Again, um, I think with other larger projects there, I've, I'm hearing about these, these, um, like, almost like smoke machines that can come in and like sanitize a space or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if um, how quickly they do it, if you would do it in between each setup or something like that. That's probably something I would look into um, on my next project to have that done to the set more often because, like I said, we are very small. So we are, you know, and first time out, constantly reminding ourselves it's, it's hard to stay six feet apart Indeed. in the movie world. <laughs> it is hard. Yeah, it's such so. a collaborative um you know activities so yes. you really can't and again it's that muscle memory that kicks in and you need mm -hmm. to interact with each of the departments to get something done um so we just like, have to stop it was so funny one night it was about to rain and they had the lightning meter out on their phones and they're like oh the lightning strike is about you know seven minutes away from us but everybody wanted to see the the lightning thing and so I walked up <laughs> And I was like, you they know, all congregated. get back. And like, everybody was like, I, I was like, get back. Uh-oh, Diane, I think you froze. Okay. No, that's okay. My phone is telling me that it needs to be charged. Um, they, okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on a charger now. But, okay. yeah, I had to make everybody get to social distancing so that we yeah could. it's it's gonna take a while for it to really sink in for everyone i just wanted yes. to chime in you referenced uh the spraying and i think the process is that they have the company come in and disinfect whatever location you're shooting in either the night before or that morning depending on your call time um and then you shoot that whole day they don't necessarily come in between setups but then after you're done and wrapped then they would come back and disinfect again if you were going to be in that location for multiple days or if now i did i did that with like i had like a cleaning crew that was doing that every night yeah. when we left we had them to come in but no a friend of mine and i'll get the i'll get the information a friend of mine share is a little machine that like like blows out something i don't know some type of spray that disinfects yeah. a whole room um but i have to i have to find out what it is i'll get it for you so that you can share it however Please you're going to share this information okay that would be great and I Sorry, see that Rhea has been dropping uh, the links in the chat for us, which is awesome. Please check those out, uh, including I saw the link for uh, insurance concerns with William Turner Mathis. You can uh, reach out to Lynn Mathis with any of your concerns about insurance and production. Um, okay, Diane, what recommendations yes. would you have for indie filmmakers that are listening that are probably 
fearful based on some of the, <laughs> the insight that you've shared with respect to budgets escalating. Um, given that your project was relatively small, are there things that you could recommend to them that they could uh, seek to do to make sure their sets are safe, obviously, without the big studio budgets being involved? Right. Wow. Whew. Or Great just question. a place to start, <laughs> like like maybe it, it starts with the script, even scaling things down. Yeah, well, yes, the script definitely. So make sure that your script, uh, if you could incorporate this world in your script somehow, that would be helpful. Um, I, I don't. I, I feel like what we I've can told come you. Back. We is, can come is, back to. It. Yeah, because I feel like what I've told you is, are things it's, that are real now, and so yeah. it's like just know that's a part of your world now so yeah there's no cutting corners it is what it no, is and we're gonna have is. to figure out how to make it happen especially if you're if you are if you are a union show or a signatory with any of the unions you have to adhere to what they are asking you to do so uh yeah and if you're not a union show i would still say do some protocols to make sure you're safe. Like if you're if you're saying that it's you want everybody to just do the free testing and you're independent, then maybe you schedule a day every every you know every week. One of those days is dedicated for your team to go out and get their testing done or something like that. Because if you're if you're truly independent and, and low budget, then maybe you adjust your schedule to say, you know what? we're going to utilize the free testing sites, but we're going to give people the day off to do that. So maybe you're shooting Monday through Thursday and Friday is testing day for everybody or something like that, or maybe Wednesday in the middle of the week or something. But I would, I would figure out a way that people could get tested for free if you cannot afford it. Um, that's the only thing that I would suggest to do. So. That's perfect. Um, okay, so I want to check in with you. We spoke about this mm -hmm. yesterday. I, I know you're dealing with weather issues. Do you think you're able to stay on for a little bit longer uh, as yes. we go Q and A? Okay, well, perfect. Is it good? Please, Edwana. Does it hit, does it hit you? <laughs> she said, "Please, Edwana." <laughs> 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 Yes. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure you was good. Okay. So yes, I can stay on a little while longer. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Okay. So it is at four fifty one now. Um, we are. What we're going to do is we're going to take one more question right now, and then I just want to let everyone know. IG Live will turn you off in an hour. So just prior to us being cut off, we're going to end this video and then go to part two. So please just log off, log right back into our IG Live for part two. But we still have a few more minutes. So we'll go Thank ahead you. and take uh, a question now. And let's just see. So um, is it City Light? City Light? She was saying, or he was saying, I think it's she that um, she's a producer in South Africa and they're pretty much doing the, um, the same protocols, well, but the, the machine is called a fogger and it's a deep clean overnight. So that's the thing that I'm talking about, this, this fogger thing. Copy, um, okay. Okay, should I, so are we just going up to see? Hey, we? Yeah, if, so okay. if you see something right away, feel free to jump in. I'm, I'm scrolling through the comments as well. Okay. Um, how could someone get into producing? I tell everybody, produce. That's how you get into producing. You produce. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but, but um, you know, there, there are courses out there. There are producer workshops. I have one. Um, there, there's an amazing book that I love to recommend to all my students. It's called From Real to Deal by Dove Simmons. That's an excellent book. Um, and then there's also the production handbook, and I always forget the name of the person who wrote it. Um, it Melissa, you have guy? yours? <laughs> yes, I bet one? that's, yep, that's it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> get that, get those two books from Real to Deal and get the production handbook, and you are good. Sakile, don't be laughing. Um, uh, someone asked, did you have background actors? Oh, yes, we did. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't cover um, our extra talent. So we did not have a lot. We we downsized or we cut that number by a lot. So, but we did have some. Um, same protocols. They did not test with us, but they had to test negative before they were um, brought on set. So we had an amazing um, extras casting director, Clive Bailey, 
who made sure that they were all COVID free before they came on set. They had to wear their masks. They couldn't take their masks off until we said they could. But in some cases, the masks were a part of them being extras in the background. But we didn't use very many. I feel like the, the most we've ever had on set was maybe 10, maybe. But we 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 had it in the COVID world, guys. It was a COVID world. So even going to restaurants, we had people, um, we only had one restaurant scene, but there weren't many people in there because just like in the COVID world right now, we don't have a lot of people that are going out to eat. Unless you're in Atlanta, but everybody seems to be out. <laughs> so, Got it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pause us right there because that's a perfect mark for us to stop this one and okay. get ready for part two so that you don't get cut off mid-answer. So everybody... Okay. Um, be thinking of your questions in the interim. I'm going to end this, save this, and then I will rebroadcast live. And Diane, just um, do the same thing. Let me know you're here so I can join you to it. And then we will pick up with part two of okay. Lights, Camera, COVID. All Thank right, China, I got you on the next question. I got you, China. Okay, go ahead.